you're on a single system, you know, a workstation or something like that, minimum is best. The more swap you add, the more swapping you're going to have, and that's bad. Okay. Okay. So it depends upon the type of the system, but on these, you just go with the default. Which is 100... 100 meg or something like that. Okay. But the usually the... You know, I guess you got default here first. But then when they're setting it for a dump, they're going like a 0.5 gig to 1 gig, depending upon the number of CPUs and how big the system is. Like if I have a 16... 16 CPU, how much would be a good thing? That'd probably be a half a gig. Okay. As a starting point. It depends upon how much they're going to dump, but that was the general rule, was enough for a dump. Mm, okay. okay. Then you have to get into Miser. So if you want Miser work bigger than Miser's reservation, that way the Miser reserved area can be used by interactive users, and if Miser wants it, then the interactive users go out to that area. Okay. Third is smallest is best. And uh, that basically means less swapping. As I said at the beginning of the week, the best way to tune IRIX is to not oversubscribe it, so that means uh, less processes and load level than the number of CPUs on your system. And the other one was less than the physical memory of the system, that the allocations are less than the physical memory, so you don't have any swap activity going on. And this was the SAR-W type of thing. Now, if you are going to live with swapping, then get it off a of root even if you can, a separate uh, controller type of thing. Okay, so if you are going to swap, you're at least not going to the drive that has LS and stuff like that. And you're better off uh, several drives. And the, the pages go round robin. Because these are small pages, no matter what you do, they're 16K byte page ins. Okay. And again, on swapping, I don't care about the page outs, it's the paging in that matters. And I could zero out an array, never use it, and let it swap out. It's when I have to bring something back in. And that was all with SAR W again, telling me how much activity I've got. But the smaller the better, get it off a root. And see, some of these sites in the uh, 10, 15 years ago would have 20 times more swap than physical memory, which allowed them to run 20 times more workload than they really had. But in those days, you had a scheduler that could decide who to swap and who you don't. Whereas in iRigs, it steals from everybody, but it picks on the biggest ones first, and those may be your important ones, when in fact, you may want to get rid of the interactive users and things like that. Okay. But that, that's my rule of thumb. Enough for a dump, half a gig to one gig on the larger origins. But if you're on a workstation, you're not, again, it depends upon your drive and what you have and how much space you're willing to commit. Now, this is a virtual memory system. So, for example, if I have an O2 and it's 96 meg and I want to run Adobe Premiere, which is a video editing application, 96 meg isn't enough for it. So rather than add swap, I'd rather add memory. Now your program can be larger than physical memory, but then you've got the performance issue of going off to that swap and bringing things in. Okay. So in that case, I could have a large file system because I'm doing video work and make my swap larger and larger, but that's just going to get me worse and worse in terms of the I.O. load that I've got going on on my system. So if I have decided that I'm going to have that swap IO traffic all the time, then I want to be smart about how I lay out my swap. But I prefer to have minimum swap and no swapping activity at all. Because if it's stealing from the largest programs, those are usually the important ones. That's why they're large. Okay. Whereas IRIX was originally thinking it could be a memory hog or something like that, where it's got a memory leak where it asks for more memory than it really needed or something. 
So it's, it's a kind of a different mindset of what to do when I run out of virtual memory. But uh, if I had a uh, one gigabyte memory system, you know, I would not put up a 20 gig swap, where some sites do, and then I have to reset their expectations. If I had a 128 gigabyte system, you know, a large 512 CPU origin or something, again, I would not make swap 20 times larger. But on a 128 gig system, if I'm going to make miser in there of 120 gig, then I am looking at a 120 gig swap or something. So that mean I'd be putting a whole bunch of drives together or something. And again, I don't think that RAID 5 is appropriate for this because RAIDs are designed for larger I.O. requests. So you're better off if you've got a RAID cabinet putting a JBOT so that the drives can act as individual pieces for all these 16 k byte pages that you're trying to bring in from SWAP. So in general, striping SWAP doesn't help you. Okay, now there are going to be, we'll come back to this, but there's some system parameters, max FC, max VC, max uh, FC. Anyway, the three of them control the size of these uh, requests when uh, the swap uh, daemon V hand is actually moving these pages around, but they only control the outs to swap. So for example, I've got one site that is running Miser. Interactive users may fill up all the memory. And then once a day, somebody comes in that has permission to use Miser, and Miser says everything that's in memory has to get evacuated from memory because this Miser work has just come along and it's more important. So now I've got to have a, a, a memory evacuation real quickly, and that might be important enough for me to strike swap. But that's not going to help me get pages back in any quicker, just get stuff out of memory quicker. And so if this is a 128 gigabyte system and I've got 120 gig that are being used by Miser, then I might start striping swap and then messing with the max parameters that are defined in system and stuff. We'll get back to those. There's the, uh, SC, FC, and DC. Max, FC, SC, and DC are the three parameters. They control the size of the I.O. request. So I group the data together into a larger chunk and then put it out to a stripe device that's been optimized or matched with the request size that the kernel's trying to write out to a swap. But when I miss a page, it's still going to be a 16k byte page coming in. And we haven't talked about this, but there's large pages, and large pages aren't going to change the swapping mechanism itself. A large page will just change the TOB addressing schemes within the programs and stuff. They don't help uh, on the swap issue. So I had one site that wanted to run 16 16 gig processes on a 16 gig system. In other words, oversubscribed memory 16 to 1. Now, if that was code 4, that may not be as much of a problem because code 4 is using only half of the memory that it physically or virtually asked for. So we're asking for 900 meg or 800 some meg, and we're only actually using 368 meg right now. So in that case, I don't even need the physical swap, I can use virtual swap. Again, the disadvantage is the kill decision, but if I have NQS running, that should prevent me from getting memory so oversubscribed that I'm going to have something killed. So NQE is going to make sure that I don't get close to the deadlock, and then I can use virtual swap as long as I don't oversubscribe virtual swap. So that rule that they, they say about, you know, depending on the amount of memory, that the amount of swap you, you should have is not really true. No. It was 10 years ago when we were in megabyte memory systems, but now that we're in hundreds of gigabyte memory systems, you just can't maintain 20 times more swap than physical memory. Now, when we run smaller systems, you'd run your application and see how much memory it really needed. Okay, so if I'm on a 96 meg machine and I'm trying to run a code 4, I'd first rather add more memory. Actually, look, what was the order? First, fix the application. Right. Okay fix the app. And in this case, I said we can't do anything about the size of code 4. But maybe, for example, with uh, Nastran, it's not a core solver. Maybe somebody set the scratch memory size real big, and so it got real big in memory. And I could drop that back down. That would be a political decision. But try to fix the application first. And then we try to size the OS. And there isn't much we can do about swapping issues. We'll talk a little bit about the paging game and stuff like that. But that doesn't really uh, have a direct effect on large memory systems. When you're buying 128 gig of memory, you generally are not going to swap 20 times. That ratio concept just doesn't apply anymore. 
So when I went to sites that were 20 to 1, that was a 1 megabyte system. Now that it's a 128 gigabyte system, I'm not going to have 50 drives out there just for swap. So there's a, there's a fall off point where you just don't maintain that ratio concept anymore. So my ratio concept is don't oversubscribe, which means a 1 to 1. Now you don't need any swap. You can delete all the swap and still run. Okay, you just have less memory. So in some cases, I will delete swap just to pull everything that's on swap back into memory and then add swap back in. But when I deleted it the other day, there wasn't enough memory to pull it all in. So it stopped. Okay. So I can completely delete swap and then add it back in on the fly. So you actually, when you start like swapping and a lot, in your system, uh, one, probably one thing to do would be, you know, to add more memory. If you feel like you're swapping, I would too first much. check the application. Okay. The sizing question doesn't help much. Then it was load levels, and in this case, it probably won't. If I'm doing Adobe Premiere on a 96 meg system, none of these are going to help me because of the nature of 96 meg not being big enough for a video editor. So then I get into the add the hardware. And then there was the expectation issue. So whenever I'm going to a solution, I'm kind of going in this order so that I don't go off and buy hardware and then say, oh, there was a problem with an application, and now I've got this extra memory or something. Okay. So this is the general order that you're going to try to deal with. What are my solutions? Can I do anything about the application? No. Can I size the OS? Miser and stuff like that will impact Code 4's ability. Remember, we already had to size the OS yesterday. We had to add more virtual swap, we added more physical swap, and we dropped down our load level too with NQE. We can't add any hardware, I have no control of that, but in some cases that's the only thing you can do. So my 96 meg 02 trying to run Adobe Premiere, I want to buy more memory. Okay, that's the realistic thing. Now, I can buy a 96 meg machine and run it but the performance is a trade-off with the price. Okay, so I've made a sacrifice in performance by buying not enough memory. And that's where you get into sizing, saying how big is Adobe Premiere actually going to be in my system with the typical film clip that I'm going to edit. And I don't mean a five-second clip. I mean maybe if it's a 15 or 20-minute clip that they're editing. At the end of this class, I'm going to have one-hour clips that I'm going to have to load in and cut into pieces. So when I size the application, I want to make sure that they're doing it with the, the real workload. If I'm crashing cars, I don't want one foot grids, I want one inch grids are more realistic to the size of the application they're trying to run. Because it's so funny, but many times I get calls about, you know, that they're getting this syslog, you know, running out of swap, uh -huh. and you basically, you know, you don't go through this, you just tell the guy, well, just add the, you know, a swap file, yeah. and that's it. And that solved the issue right away, but sometimes uh, my question is, I feel like, you know, that could be a solution at, for the moment. Yeah, But exactly. if you really don't go through a certain analysis of your application, and what you're you doing, it, it will come back, and probably what you're doing is not the best thing because you're adding a file right. to your system, and I, and, and I have to admit, most of the time I add the swap file to the root, you know, root file system, yeah. you know, but which again, sometimes it, it might be wrong. It goes back to how big the system is, and if they spend $500 on a real small system, I can't help them much. Okay. That's, that's getting down to the expectation issue. So in addressing your question, that's why I recommend you look at your solutions in this order. Okay. So. We, and that's what we're going to start today now, is do a sanity check on our applications and say, are they efficient in the way they're using the system, or was there a mistake in how they were configured such that they're oversized or doing something wrong? Okay. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So in this particular case, your question is sizing the OS. I've got, I've got the ability of building virtual memory with physical memory, physical swap, and virtual swap. Virtual swap is the cheapest but then you've got the kill decision that's different. Now if I'm on a workstation, I still like virtual swap on because if it dies, it's me and I'm live with the application or something. So I can have more breathing room for all this virtual malloc space that I never really use. But again, it goes back to the application and each, each situation is different. But just 
trying to think of it in this order. So we're going through all these different options, and I've already, uh, we haven't looked at the applications yet, that's what we're doing now, but yesterday we started sizing the OS by adding physical swap and uh, adding virtual swap and things like that, but there were trade-offs in doing that. Okay. And I was trying to run four or five code fours. If they're one gig in size on a two gig system, running that many might be unrealistic. So that's where I have to get into leveling the load. And that was our MQE uh, configuration. So today or tomorrow, I'm going to put in a multi-queue structure that puts quote fours just in a huge queue, and then only allow to run one of them at a time. And then I can't oversubscribe things. So if this customer calling in and saying I got killed, I would still look at it in this order. Maybe the program had a memory leak. That's entirely possible. That's happened at a couple of sites. Gaussian, for example, being killed because of shared memory being uh, allocated, but the program kills and can't clean up the shared memory segment. Uh, in that case, when you, you have memory leak, what kind of error message you would see? They look the same. They look the you same. get the kills. Mm -hmm. So there is no, nothing that can tell you exactly that it's that. It's the, no. It, they have to go through the program and see. You have to look and you have to know what sizes of programs were beforehand. But in my case with this Dresden study, the memory leak showed virtual memory reservation constantly going up. And never going down, right? Never. Well, the real memory wasn't. It was just the virtual memory that was going up. Okay. So these were shared memory segments reserved, but never given back to the system okay. because the program is killed by the kernel or by NQS before it can free up those resources. So uh, every situation is different. You got to figure out what's using memory and do a sanity check on what's happening there and say, uh, is my swap virtual swap properly configured for the situation that I have. I would not use virtual swap in a fail-safe situation, in a database server, web server, video server, those sorts of environments, NFS servers even. Though in an NFS server, the, the NFS demons are that big in memory, so they're not a candidate to get killed as much, but it's still a fail-safe situation, reliability being more important. Uh, some of these sites, they may, may need to just be more realistic about how many things they can run before they actually kill. So this exact scenario is what we went through yesterday, code 4 was dying. And I used several options. I added virtual swap to keep on going without spending money. But then I had to live with the kill decision, the trade-off there. Before, the application was dying on its own, saying no memory. Afterwards, the syslog was showing I've got kills. So in your case, if they're saying it's in syslog, I would possibly check to see if virtual swap is on and whether that's what they want. Because they're obviously running out of physical allocatable memory and physical swap. So we'll come back to some of that sort of stuff, but every time I go for a solution, I try to do this sanity check in this order and say, do I have problems with the application? Is the operating system properly configured for the type of environment or application mix that they're running? If they're a batch interface, can I back off on some loads and eventually add more hardware? Sometimes that's the only option. Okay, the 96 meg uh, Adobe Premiere situation. You got to buy more memory in that situation. There is a situation where you can get, you can get, you can get, um, you know, out of swap space but still have physical memory. Yeah, but that's a reservation versus allocation more than likely. Oh, uh, because uh, swap is reservation. But when physical is allocation, right? We'll, we'll come back to that, but both physical memory and physical swap have a reservation level on the malloc, and then an allocation level when I actually reference the data. To the physical memory. Right. So I could reserve a whole bunch of memory, but then when I ask for it, it's not really there. For example, in virtual swap. Okay. Yeah, because I have a like customer. I probably, I don't even understand really well how it works, that they call and they say, well, how in the world I have out of swap when I have, you know, I still have physical memory, you know. Right. So, and I know. So that's where you have to go through the reservation process that, that we went through yesterday. Let me get rid of this. So we kind of went through several commands. Some of this falls on Friday again, but we went through it yesterday too. 
So I started off with things like top, which would tell me everything and show me. Actually, with top, there's a sort by size. So you can actually find the biggest program in memory and stuff like that. Okay. Then we also use PMEM. I'm sorry, before that, we actually used swap dash S. And that gave us what our virtual memory was. Uh, one of the commands that we used briefly was gross view. And it was the uh, SWP display that would also show the same information as swap in a graphical interface. So these are telling me on a per process basis how big they are, and I can and find out the biggest and then say, is it supposed to be that big? Though I, if I don't know, if I don't have any reference, I can't decide that. Then these two, uh, ASCII and GUI, tell me of my virtual address, physical memory, physical swap and virtual swap, how much is reserved and how much is allocated. So these sort out the reservations and allocations. Then we went to PMAM. Okay, and PMAM gave me my virtual and my physical. The virtual and what we're calling the RSS, or the physical size. Now we missed this command, but GMAM usage would also be useful, which is basically the GUI for PMAM, just like gross view is a GUI for the swap command. Did you switch pens? Sure. I'm <laughs> drying up. And what two other things did we want to check on our memory reservations that we had to go through yesterday? Two other things that can reserve memory. These are all showing what? Live processes that are on the system. Okay, but what else is out there? IPCS, much better, mm -hmm. dash A. In particular, the AM option, which gives me shared memory. And that's where we went through that N attach concept. To say, okay, I'm running out of memory and things are dying. Or is there any shared memory segments out there that re reserved memory and the process is gone and I can release them then with an IPCRM? By the way, this is a problem where if uh, an application doesn't free up all these IPC things, and then I say, okay, let's just up the number of shared memory segments I can have, that just makes the problem worse. So that's why you want to check your application first. So that's what I'm doing here. And then also was Miser. Right out while I was talking. So these are all the different things that are going to account for what's taking up memory on my system. That's kind of the order. We also, I guess, had up here a SAR dash little r, which will give me how much virtual memory. Let's take a look at that one. So, actually, when a process is uh, run, the first thing he does is to allocate all the memory he will need and no, swap, to reserve. right? To reserve. Okay, reserve the memory he will need and swap, right? Well, not swap, just out of the virtual memory address space. So it's, it's got a certain amount of virtual memory. Now, it's actually here called vSwap, which is a bad name for this metric. So this is r dash little r. This is saying, how much left do I have? Okay. So going back to my memory map, we have virtual swap, physical swap, and then physical memory. And all of that is my virtual memory address space. So the process actually doesn't take anything for physical memory, right? Not necessarily. Like it runs. It just makes a reservation out of that virtual memory pool. So I can continue reserving in the virtual swap. But here I can reserve on the malloc, and then I go to an allocate, or other systems will call it a commit, 
and that's when I actually have a physical address. And that's done on the actual read or write or fetch the reference to that actual address within my program. So once I use it, then I convert that virtual reservation into an actual allocation. That's when I have to create the page if it's not already there, or find the page if it's out on the file system or out on the swap. Oh, so actually the man log command, it actually reserving physical memory always? No, it's reserving out of virtual memory. Oh, it's anywhere, okay. Anywhere, it's just reserving out of this pool. Okay. We don't decide where it is here until we get to the allocation process. Oh, now I understand, okay. Yeah. So I reserve it ahead of time, and some people, malloc, you could malloc a 64 gig uh, memory space and only use one meg of it for your data. Okay, there are programs that say, I don't know how big the data is going to come in, so I'm going to reserve a big space, or sloppy programming. I know I've got a, an ASCII buffer for data coming in, so I allocate a big space, I accidentally picked a number, and then I only use a little bit of it. So what are those situations in which you actually you get all your swap out of swap and you still have your physical memory? I mean, right. what kind of situation is that one? Well, there are a couple of things that are going on there, and we need to talk about those Friday. Okay. But there's some system parameters that are controlling the headroom here. So there's always the kernel is always going to make sure that there's some breathing room here. And this is VHAN and shape D that are doing that. And I want to save that for Friday, but in particular is one called uh, what was it? Oh I'm gonna save it. It was uh min free pages is what I'm thinking of. And then also some V hand settings that we're gonna talk about G page high, G page low RSS hog frag, that sort of thing. So those things are always trying to keep some of my physical memory available and pushing them out to physical swap. So as my memory fills up, it starts going through these pages and shifting them to physical swap, and I start swapping. That's done on a least recently used algorithm, but it picks on the largest processes first. So I, I've always got some physical memory available still. Now, to get back to here, the SAR dash little r, try it on any of your systems, try it on do or try it on your workstation. The first one says, how much free memory do I have? That's your physical memory. The second one says, how much of a swap is free? And the third one was, I don't like the name. It should be free VMAM. That would be the much better metric name there. The amount of virtual memory that's free. So this one is describing what's left here. The second one is describing what's left here. The third one's describing what's left of the entire virtual memory system. If I add more swap, that goes up. If I take swap away, that goes down. If I add more physical memory, it goes up. If I take away physical memory, it goes down. And if I add virtual swap, it also goes up. So V, v is a bad, V swap is a bad name for it. It should really be free VMAM, the amount of virtual memory that's free. So in your situation, uh, this may be showing going down to zero. This may not be going down to zero, but this one might be going down to zero, where you're running out of physical memory because VHAND and Shake D are trying to keep a certain amount of memory free. By default on a small system, VHAND was trying to keep 25% of your memory free. Now on a 96 meg machine, that's quite a bit. But when you get past four gig, it doesn't matter anymore. 25%, it actually stops in 100 megabyte instead of 25%. VHAN will never try to keep more than 100 megabyte free. But Shake D, if they've modified mint free pages, that could result in a lot more uh, memory space being kept open and swapping occurring when you still got physical memory available. But I want to come back to that Friday, Friday morning. Okay. So we need to get back to this. I think the NIS server is nice. For do or for us? No, I can't log in. To your workstation? Yeah. I was in there and everything was locked up. We couldn't do anything. So what's happening? Is anybody else? My workstation is working. 
But I haven't tried to get into do. I'm going to try guess to see what happens. Syslog error messages that tells me they probably have uh, virtual swap or not. And then you've got to ask more specifics about if they're a batch environment, they should back off on their NQB limits or something like that. Reboot, anyways. stress the order of solutions so that you don't get into that catch-22 is the way I call it. And then as I'm going through my resources again, I'm going to go uh, CPU service time first. So from the accounting data and the politics, we know that code 2 is our bread and butter, so that's what we're going to look at next. And yesterday from the accounting data, we saw most of it was code 2. Then I'm going to look at system time. By the way, in CPU servers, we are going to multi-thread, and that's what we need to do this morning. And then system time is, again, part of user time showing up in top and that sort of thing. Then I'm going to talk about disk I08. Then CPU wait, and that'll include miser and CPU sets. Then we're going to talk about buffer cache. Then we're going to talk about memory. Now when I'm solving a problem, I'm looking at the information this way, but the solution depends upon my particular situation. Every situation is different. Okay, so in this example, we had to deal with memory right away yesterday. But as I add more and more swap, I'm going to start getting a swapping problem, and I'm going to end up coming back to it again. But everything that happens up here is going to uh, affect the memory issue. This was buffer cache I08. And this is swapping, swap weight. So I've got the elapsed time components. These are the elapsed time components I'm going to be looking at. Right now, code 2 is CPU service bound. Code 3 is disk bound. Code 4 is memory bound. And we were hitting CPU wait times yesterday, too. We, we ran that uh, uh, 64 copies all at once on the 16 CPU system. So we're going to see some of that data today as well. And I'm going to reboot the system now. class is really system tuning, but, but before I deal with the system issues, I've got to check the application. So 
So really using axcms sar dash u and then a specific thing like uh, actcom csacom or actcvt using these things has told me the top CPU applications. And SPV yesterday showed us from the command summary report code 2, code 203, all that sort of thing. I might also have a user complaint that's directing me to a particular application. Or I might see something with top. And then I also have to check politics. Putting all these things together, I then have just decided to investigate an application. If I get to a compute server, I usually write down the top 10 applications. So I want the top CPU, top memory, and top I.O. And again, the AXCMS report we used yesterday with SPV. Now the SAR-U tells me whether CPU, memory, or I.O. are what I care about. So if I look at SAR-U and I see uh, memory is always used, but my run queue length is less than the number of CPUs, then I'm going to be more interested in memory. And maybe I have to worry about all three. With this class, we're exceeding all three resources. We oversubscribed CPU yesterday. We were also oversubscribing memory, resulting in a kill. And then when we added swap, when we oversubscribed memory, we ended up swapping to the swap device, and that slowed down our interactive response as well. And then I pulled the swap off of root and uh, home directories to try to get the swap I.O. away from my important file systems. What else might bring me to an application? Particularly with top the long running ones. When you see something that's been running for days or weeks, remember I said code two, the shortest has been 166 seconds. The longest has been two weeks. You want to think of any other reason they might be picking a particular application? In our case, the data center manager, my politics said code two, and the accounting data also confirmed that code two is taking up all the CPU time. And also, by the way, in our mix, code 2 was the one that was largest in CPU time, 2,000 seconds. And I said politically I wanted it 166 seconds repeatedly, because I know I can get it there. Okay, so I'm putting all this information together, like a jigsaw puzzle again, and saying, okay, this is the application that I want to look at. Now, in some cases, you don't have control of the application, and you end up talking to vendors to say, here's what I'm seeing with this application. If the, if the uh, site does not have uh, source code, for example, then you're kind of in a catch of saying they've got to talk to their vendor for the application about here's what I've seen from the data. Now, just to try to summarize things, we're only interested in CPU service time right now. I'm not going to talk about application system calls until later, and the rest of these are all going to fall into the next couple of days. So our focus right now is just on CPU service time. Okay. So the main two tools are going to be SS run and also perfex. There are a lot of other tools there, but for our purposes, these are the two we care about. Because they give me time domain information but they're only describing my CPU service time. And I'm not picking codes one, three, or four because they have much less CPU service time. I'm only picking code two because it was the most important and also the one that was furthest away from my target goal, 166 seconds. And it's also the big CPU one. So I'm picking on that one first. When we come back to things, the I.O. ones and the memory ones, then PAR matters. But I'm going to leave PAR alone right now. 
But in profiling the applications, those are probably the most important three. And I guess for memory, we had PMEM and GMEM usage. There are some other tools as well for memory. So, is do back up yet? When I left, I fired off a whole bunch of work, and I'm just going to take the last report that I have here and take a look at it and see what I've got. Saw a JA problem. Okay, so here's my application, and again, this one actually ran at 2,069 seconds, and I'm running under Timex or SS, run, SS usage. Again, I don't care about SS usage in this example because I get that from the global data. My Timex or SS usage data is what came out of the ACCOM, CSACOM, or ACCVT data. So I, I don't need this number here because I can get it from global log. This isn't the one I want to look at. The other one I wanted to find was one that was a uh, perfect and par report. And for some reason, I'm not seeing one that we're at. Okay, let me just submit one. Go to growth.nqs. NQS, go to growth.nqs, and go to perf.nqs. Now there are a lot of other reports, but the main one I'm interested in here with SS run is called a dash user time experiment. So this is going to account where all my CPU service time is going. And this is by routine. And then with Perfex, there's a dash A, dash X, dash Y that I'm using to profile the hardware counters in this application while it's running. Let me just see if I've got the applications running. So I've got three copies of Co203 running on a lightly loaded system right now. By the way, all these uh, Code 203s are an optimized version. Remember I said that also with the compiler, right now I'm doing an F7703, whereas before I was using a default compiler. These numbers here were all default compiler numbers. So while I'm waiting for those to finish, let me go to my web page presentation. applications, I'm basically doing a sanity check. I'm saying, is it wasteful or is it productive? What am I doing during that time? I've got 2,000 seconds there. What am I doing during those 2,000 seconds? Okay. okay so did I miss six somehow? What's that? Did I miss chapter six? I'm skipping over it, yes. Okay. Uh, we, chapter 6, we basically installed PCP as the most important piece for that. But most of Chapter 6 is just showing the tool samples, and we're going to use them as needed. So basically, getting PCP working yesterday was what I do for Chapter 6, and I always skip it. So just to try back, tie back to the workbook, know your workload. That's what we're doing right now. 
And that's what I was talking about right here. How do I pick what I'm going to what I'm going to pick on? I was using the Act CMS report. I was using top. I'm working on the applications that dominate the system. So I pick the top ten applications and say, are they efficient or are they wasting things? Are they wasting CPU time doing nothing but thrashing? A lot of people use the word thrashing to describe a system that is in trouble. It's kind of like being on the freeway in stop and stop traffic. You're spending all of your time pushing the brake, responding to the traffic around you. You're not getting any real work done. My rule of thumb has always been a 10% rule. If 10% of my time is not productive, then I'm thrashing. Now we're going to talk about several different thrashing effects that are application specific. So these are the things that I'm looking for when I go to my applications. And I may as well just get it done now, but the first thing is TOB misses. TOB misses can be non-productive. I can get into larger page sizes and I can also redesign my application. For example, I said yesterday, a lot of codes are still written for Cray Word vector machines, and the way they laid out their data was designed for the stride patterns on a Cray. And a lot of those algorithms designed for vectors need to be redesigned for cache-based machines. I'll show you the uh, application tuning guide that tells you how to deal with recoding the application to take care of that. So there are several things that you can do about TLB misses, but they can be very expensive. We'll talk about a TLB miss, but yesterday we said it's basically asking the kernel to find the physical location for the page because it's not on chip. I don't know where the physical location is. The second effect that we care about is secondary cache misses. People refer to this as cache thrashing, system cache thrashing. There's a whole bunch of different types of secondary cache miss problems. The first one I'm going to call cache busting. It's an 8 megabyte cache on our newer systems, and my program is in the order of 1 gig in size. My data is bigger than my secondary cache. No matter what I do, I'm going to have uh, data that's not going to be in my secondary cache. Now with the hardware, with prefetch operations, I may be able to keep that data fed ahead of me before I need it, but that depends upon how I go through the data. So cache busting is what crate people always try to do to beat cache-based machines. Let's not make the, the car crash a one-foot grid, let's make the car crash a one-millimeter grid. And then that makes the problem much bigger, and then we bust the cache, and that's where things like vector machines were designed for. So cache busting is a property of how big the program is to how big the cache is. Now code 2, for example, was 22 meg in size, but we didn't look at how much of the physical memory it's really using in the array, but that's a good bet that it's bigger than the 4 meg cache that I have on the system. So code 2 is likely able to miss cache a lot because of the data being bigger than it can hold in secondary cache. Whereas, for example, code 3 was 3 megabyte, it can definitely hold any data that it's working with in secondary cache. It's small enough to do that. Okay. So cache busting is a property that the resolution of the model, for example. If I do weather, instead of a 100 mile grid, maybe I do it down to a 1 mile grid, something like that. I get a finer resolution model to what I'm doing. Okay. So that's cache busting. The second one was cache strides. By the way, none of this is really documented anywhere in the industry. This is the way I am trying to describe the different types of cache effects. Cache striding is how I'm going through the data. Cache busting was a property of how big the data is. This one is how do I go through the data. For example, gather, scatter, stellar physics, Monte Carlo algorithms. I've got sparsely populated arrays with some data in clumps and lots of space in between. So in that situation, there's no definite stride pattern to how I go through my data. So cache strides, again, is, for example, a three-dimensional array. I go through the x-dimension, I go through the y-dimension, but when I go through the z-dimension, 
the way the array is laid out, I end up missing and just striding through it fine. Both of these things are not something we can do at the system level other than buy more hardware, buy larger secondary caches, things like that. These go back to application, rewriting the algorithms. Both of these go back to converting prey vector optimized algorithms to a cache based machine algorithm. The third type of cache miseffect that I'm looking for now is what I call system cache thrash. This is due to the CPU scheduler, and this is what Miser and P sets and CPU sets are all about. We're going to get into that tomorrow. So system cache thrash is when I've got more processes than CPUs. Code 2 comes in loads the four megabyte cache with its data, and then the scheduler says, oh, I'm going to let somebody else use that CPU. So they come in, warm secondary cache, and when you come back in, your data's not in secondary cache anymore. You go back to memory for it, and that causes your service time to go up and down. It's in unpredictable. So with things like uh, Miser and CPU sets, you can lock it down in the CPU, leave it alone. Nobody else uses that CPU. It's your private secondary cache no other program can pollute it, and you get repeatable timings. So when people talk about variability run to run, this is one of the things that could cause it. Okay. So you, you should never have more processes than CPUs. Correct. That is a customer expectation that might, might have to be changed. Okay. But if they are running, if the SARDASH Q is bigger than the number of CPUs, they're going to have processes that are losing affinity to the CPU and, and having their data in secondary cache wiped out by another program, and when they come back in, it's not there anymore. Now, I'm going to measure this and show you what system cache thrash looks like. Well, if that's the case, then anytime you do a W, your, your load average should never exceed the number of CPUs you got in. That's correct. Except that's a smooth number, but it's a good start. Yes, I would prefer the load level to be less or approximately the number of CPUs. Now, if I'm on a one CPU system, I'm going to live with higher load levels because of the nature of that. But when you get past eight CPUs, the purpose of those machines is to have those CPUs private and to lock things down into them. Okay. So there are going to be a lot of things that the system scheduler or system tuner is going to deal with in system cache thrash effects. The other two are application. The third or fourth one, then, is called false cache sharing. Now, these effects are more common maybe in single-threaded. But when you actually get into multi-threaded, false cache sharing is unique to multi-threaded applications. OpenMP, I really should say OpenMP. And I talked a little bit about false cache sharing yesterday, but false cache sharing was I spawn off several threads but they're all sharing the same uh, uh, stack variables within the program subroutine. It's the same subroutine. So maybe I've got uh, one line that has i equals zero, and then I'm going to increment it each time I go through the loop. And maybe the next one is pi equals 3.14 or something like that. So this one I'm constantly incre incrementing to say how many times did I go through the loop. But right next to it is something I'm only reading and they're sharing the same cache line. It's like a 32 byte per cache line. So false cache sharing is where each thread has to keep rereading this line and is waiting for the pi number because the hardware said, I've just changed i, so you've got to reload both of them back into your uh, CPU. As my thread width goes wider, as number of threads goes up, false cache sharing becomes a much worse problem. Code 2 has false cache sharing problems. It runs best two threads wide. You go past six, eight threads wide, it's worse than it is single threaded. So with the programmer, again, this is a programmer issue. The programmer has to go in and pad or rearrange the data at the top of the subroutine. Or it could be global data as well. Any sort of data that's grouped together. 
So all that data you'd like to separate the reads and the writes. The constants and the constantly changing stuff. The last effect as a system tuner that I care about is multi-threaded barrier breakdown. So we're going to look at the two types of reports and learn to identify which type of problems you have here. Multi-threaded barrier breakdown is also going to be worse as the number of threads gets wider. As we go more and more threads wide. So just some, because somebody buys a 512 CPU origin doesn't mean that Fluent, which is a mold injection type of program, is going to scale 500 threads wide. You run it and figure out what's the best thread width for this vendor application that I have. And some of them don't go better than two or four or eight. You're lucky if you can get it past 100 threads wide. And that is all going back to the algorithm within the application as it's processing the data. Okay. So these are the different types of effects that we're going to be looking for. Now we've already been mostly seeing system cache crash. We haven't started multi-threading yet. So we don't see these last two effects. And most of our programs are small enough such that they're not busting cache and their strides are sequential. Really not seeing these right now. Code 4, big in memory, is still a sequential stride. It's not gather, scatter. And I don't mean to imply that these are single threaded problems only, but these are the ones that dominate the single threaded applications. They don't have these problems. Whereas these multi threaded applications, these two problems are much bigger a problem than these three effects. So let's just go back to the workbook here. At this point, I'm trying to match up the baseline with what the data center staff think. That's, that's what we already did now. I said code two was showing up in the accounting data is the biggest thing. Code two was politically important. And code two was not getting a quality of service that was expected. So everything right now is to have us look at code two. So there are a whole bunch of tools. I'm just trying to zoom in on the three key ones or two that we care about right now. This afternoon, PAR will be there for I.O., as well as using PAR when we start multi-threading. Perfex we're going to use extensively. End stats I don't care about right now, but that takes a look at local memory versus remote memory references. This is a NUMA type of command, NUMA stats. There's also some commands that we'll briefly look at for memory information. DPRO shows me how many times I hit memory pages and DLOOK and DVIEW show me the properties of the size of the page, or the size of the process pages. Size we don't really care about right now. We've already used accounting data. And GMEM usage, you've probably seen it before, but we're not going to use it right now. So, what are my options? When I get to high CPU time, the first thing is to try to rewrite the algorithm. That's the biggest bang for your buck but it also requires somebody to rewrite the code, certify the code, and make sure that it's giving the right answers and all that sort of thing. So that can take a couple of years sometimes. One of the things to keep in mind is system call use. Some of these codes were written 20, 30 years ago, and believe me, I still find codes 40 years old. I think Arco was one of the sites that I went to that was like that. You know how I can tell a 40-year-old code? The memory management techniques that it uses. You know what they did 40 years ago? They didn't have dynamic memory yet. So they basically had a program that looked at the data set and then generated a template name that hard code size, the array sizes in it. Then they compile the entire application for that particular data set with all the arrays hard set to that particular size. And then they run off that binary. So they compiled and linked the whole thing every time they looked at the data set. That's what they did in 1960, before we had Malix and all that kind of stuff. So you still have programs that old, and they have to get rewritten. Now, programs that are 40 years old, the computers are a lot slower in those days. So for example, I could put a U name in the middle of a routine and hit it every five minutes, 
and maybe nowadays it's every second or something like that. So as the CPUs get faster and faster, the elapsed time is getting shorter, the service time is getting shorter, but the intensity of the system calls is going up. So I had one subroutine once that was figuring out how many CPUs I had, and it was doing that 100 times a second, okay, which isn't going to change that often. In that case, they moved it out of the loop and checked at the beginning of the loop or something like that. Okay. And that gave a significant performance improvement. So SAR, is, or PAR, I mean, PAR is going to look at our system call use. The next one then is let the compiler do the work. That's all we're doing. I cannot rewrite the application in this class. We can't touch the source code. But we can use the compiler options. So I'm using a dash 03 in this class. Now I tell people, crank it as fast as you can and then figure out numerical accuracy. Because going to the dash 03 will create truncation or rounding of your numbers, which may or may not matter depending upon the resolution of the data that they're tracking. So I'm going in 03, recognizing that there will be rounding effects there, and then if that's a problem, I can turn those rounding effects off explicitly. Also, I always optimize single threaded before I start looking at multi-threading. Okay, if I'm spending all my time on TLB misses, let's take care of that issue before we multi-thread it. Uh, second piece possibly managing memory better. We're not going to talk about it here, but there are compiler directives to place my data in the topology of the system. So I can say, put this page on this particular memory node. The problem with that, though, is that if I have a multi-user environment and both people want the same location, only one gets it. It's a soft guarantee. Now, there's also a command line level D place to do the same sort of thing. So I can put in compiler direct to say take this array and put it here. Or I can use D place and say put these things in this location of the topology. So now that we've got topology based machines, there are commands to give clues to the operating system of where you want to be in the system. Put me close to a disk drive, put me close to a graphics device. I'm, I'm handling data coming from a satellite, put me close to the channel where that data is coming so I don't have to pipe it through all these routers to get it into my memory. Things like that. Also, adjusting page sizes. These TLB misses. If I have large TLB misses, I first want to recode the application. Rearrange the data. Fix the application first if I can. What did TLB stand for? Uh, translation look aside buffer. So it's a cache on chip that contains the virtual and physical addresses of every pro, uh, page of the program I'm trying to use. So every time I jump to an address, I've got to check my TLB buffer to say, do I know where that physically is in memory? And this was set up or loaded by the kernel. But if I've got an array that goes X, Y, Z, the Z dimension I may be striding in, and I may be better actually in shuffling my data, copying it, and then going through it sequentially, what they call transposing arrays, blocking arrays, stuff like that. Now, these are not direct subjects of this class. But that would be the first thing is to try to recode the application. The other thing, though, might be large pages. IRIC supports larger page sizes now. So if I go to a larger page, I don't take as many TLB misses because I can describe more memory in that same single address. This TLB buffer, by the way, by default is 128 addresses. That's the size of the buffer. What's our default page? It used to be 4K, now it's a rerun. It's 4K on the 32 bit kernel and it's 16K on the 64 bit kernel. And I can go larger than 16K bytes. But that's only in the allocation process that does not affect swapping or paging in or anything like that. Now, what if I went to larger page sizes and my TLB misses did not change? What could that mean? If I'm gather scatter. If I'm jumping all over the place and going to a larger page size, I may still be jumping off that page. So if I'm sequentially processing my data, then larger page sizes will help. 
But if I'm not, if I'm jumping gather, scatter, or Monte Carlo algorithms, random number generator essentially, you're jumping all over the place in that sort of program. Gather, scatter types of effects, or astrophysics, stellar physics, things like that. So in those situations, going to larger pace size will hurt more than help. Because you have to do garbage collection. Something called coalescing. To coalesce memory. So when I set up large pages, I say I want a certain percentage that are 16K byte, I want a certain percentage that are 64K byte, I want a certain percentage that are 16 megabyte. And then the coalesce daemon has to maintain those targets. So the coalesce daemon starts spending all this CPU time and this memory shuffling activity going on, which ties up block transfer engines and causes buffer cache to get slower too. So some people may actually go to larger pages and not actually get any benefit, but get worse because the coalesce team is not getting anything productively done. Okay. So anyways, adjusting page size may or may not help depending upon how I go through my data. And shared text or dynamic shared objects, that can save memory, but what's the disadvantage? If I have a 128 CPU system and my square root function is sitting on one node, I may end up having all the CPUs going to the one node for that one particular piece. So I may save memory, but now I get hotspots on node conflicts. I keep going to the same node for the same uh, program, subroutine, that's in a dynamic shared object or a, a, sh a shared library. So there are, in the benchmarking group, people that have done, instead of shared text, they've done uh, non-shared libraries, but they're not supported. Uh, this afternoon we're going to get into I.O. more, but doing better I.O. Use a faster disk, reduce your system call use, don't move a terabyte of data one byte at a time. 64K byte is the most common denominator for our I.O. paths. So that's, if you can group your data to a 64K byte, that's a good start. Possibly rewrite your I.O., uh, bypassing buffer cache, changing buffer sizes, going direct to disk, going raw I.O., all those are going to be faster. So, I first of all have to figure out where to tune. Again, we don't care about it, but when I do an SS run, it's going to give me my top subroutine. What we are going to care about is comparing that to the multi-thread version. If a user comes to me with an SS run report and the top routines are all uh, SGI system library routines, then it's my problem, not the application's problem. And I'll tell you right now, the application name or subroutine name you're looking for is MP Slave Wait for Work. MP Slave Wait for Work is multi-threaded barrier problems. This is like playing phone tag with all your th other threads. You're talking to the other process piece saying, have you finished your per portion of the work yet? But they can't all be connected on a party line. They're playing phone tag, leaving messages with each other and never actually talking to each other, saying, yes, I got my work done. So when Code 2 took two weeks, it was multi-threaded barrier problems. I waited two weeks to get the output because I wanted to see the output. And it was NP slave wait for work. So there's 100 seconds worth of computation and two weeks worth of phone tag with the other threads. And we're going to see that today as well. So anyways, try to find where to tune, and SS Run is going to give you that. Use existing tuned code. As you upgrade compilers and stuff, you're loading newer libraries that have been optimized better for the typical situation that the developers are seeing. Let the compiler do the work. If I have to rewrite the application, then I have to go through a recertification process. If I can let the compiler do it all, great. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people do that with the dash APO. Remember, the second one we were going to try was APO for multi-thread in OpenMP. That's what I call lazy parallelization, and it will paralyze you in a lot of cases. All four codes I have will run worse with APO multi-threaded than they run single-threaded because of barrier synchronization problems. Because I didn't rewrite the application, I just depended upon dash APO and the compiler to do my thinking for me. In a lot of those cases, APO is not going to help you. Okay. 
make virtue. 